love is often expressed as a verb uh, because love is an action, it's not a feeling. And when we love someone, actually what we do is we do certain things, those necessary things, so that the object of our love know that they matter, that they're important, and that they're a priority. The same is true with God. For God so loved that he expressed that love by sending his son. And if you want to know uh, if God loves, you look at his son, for Jesus is the face of God's love. I'm sure you can guess what our topic is this morning. We're on the second sermon of our four-part sermon series, Deconstructing John 3.16. Today we're going to focus on God sending his son as an expression of that love. Glad that you're joining us here at St. Paul through our online ministries. Uh, we want to hear from you. Uh, down in the right-hand corner of the screen is an opportunity for you to sign in. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. At the same time, if there's something that's meaningful about the service, it could be the music or maybe a certain prayer or an aspect of the worship or even something about the sermon uh, that's important to you, we definitely want to hear from you. That helps us in our sermon planning. Again, welcome. Welcome to St. Paul through our online worship. And at this time, we'll join our service, which is already in progress. To sign up online for VBS, Vacation Bible School, and St. Paul Summer Camp. And uh, on those sign up pages are opportunities, also links for youth and adults to be involved. So I set that all before you to, uh, to prayerfully consider how you will be able to um, serve in the summer this year. Easter egg hunt is on Maundy Thursday, and, um, and there's information in there, uh, our bulletin about that. But I'll draw your attention to, for the last couple weeks, I have been saying, bring candy, bring candy. And uh, unfortunately, Grace caught me, because if you bring them in filled eggs, I can't eat them. So um, I want to go ahead and re reiterate that you're supposed to bring pre-filled eggs with candy in them. So if you're out and about and you see some with candy in them, buy a couple bags, drop them off here at the church, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, or the, uh, the ladies here will make sure that they don't get into my office at all. I promise that. North of 60 event, that's the group that has activities for those who are around 60 or higher. And, uh, um, and, and the next one is on this Saturday, March 9th at 10 a.m., to learn to play or to play pickleball. Has anybody, even if you're not anywhere near 60, has anybody ever played pickleball? Okay, this is when you actually, you, you actually respond. The, I know somebody in this church has played pickleball before. So let's say it again. Has anybody played pickleball? Thank you. Three up there and there. there. So um, if you're not even uh, aware of what pickleball is and you don't think you can play, um, I believe uh, you can have some fun if you're around the 60 or older age. Uh, if you want to learn to play, it is a lot of fun. And um, you can uh, reach out to Julie Chapman for information. There's a place where you can sign up online. But um, they were going to be playing pickleball this Saturday, March 9th, at the, at the Columbus Country Club. And there's information about that in our bulletin. The flowers on the sanctuary altar today are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Charles Briscoe by his family. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship.
Our hymn of celebration this morning is hymn number 64. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Please remain standing as we unite in the historic confession of the Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. Would you join me as we take a few moments to prepare our hearts for prayer? (laughs) 
Gracious God, we come with a lot on our hearts and our minds. Many of those, O oh God, um, we, we bring to this place, and um, for one reason or another, we want to hold on to those. Uh, we want to um, fix those. We want to um, we want to make our make ourselves redeemed, redeem ourselves by uh, manipulating the different circumstances. But at any rate, O oh God, we we do bring these with us, and and sometimes, O oh God, those can be barriers for us to hear what you really want us to hear. And so, in my life and all of our lives, I pray that that we would see this as an opportunity for your grace being revealed as brand spanking new this morning. If we need, oh God, a little strength to, uh, to set those aside, I pray that you would give us that through the Holy Spirit. To open a window of our hearts, to crack a door into our minds. To hear, oh God, of that incomprehensible, unconditional, and amazing love that became a catalyst of God that set into motion redemption through your Son. We pray, O oh God, that your name would be renowned we pray, O oh God, that our attention would be upon Your gift and Your love. And even if we don't feel we deserve it, we have some questions about it, would You allow us, O oh God, to bend an ear towards it for just a moment? Not for our glory, but Yours. Not for our kingdom, but yours. We ask these things in the name of that marvelous gift, Jesus Christ, as he taught his disciples to pray by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now worship God with His tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Gracious God, receive these, your tithes and our offerings, and allow them to be multiplied within this church so that we may be able to further your kingdom and hasten your return. It's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen.
Please remain standing as we read our gospel lesson today from John's gospel, chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the Word of God for the people of God. God. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Once again, I welcome you, members and visitors alike. We're so glad that you are worshiping with us today, as well as those who might be worshiping with us at home. Here in our sanctuary, there's a red pew pad. Please take a moment to register your attendance. If you're on the inside pew, uh, the aisle, um, register your t- pass it down and pass it back again, and maybe even learn the names of those who are worshiping around you. And as you pass the peace of Christ with those around you, I invite the children now to meet Grace over here at my left and your right for children's sermon or for children's church. So go ahead and greet one another. It doesn't matter, right? You get nervous reading the passage without looking at the text, like you forget something. <laughs> so, I figured I probably should have known that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think so, right? Yeah. So. It, it is good to see you. I asked John, um, for those that have served as liturgists, um, sometimes there's about a half a second of delay and it's something you might have read or quoted a million times, like John 3.16. Um, with the delay, it can throw off your, your rhythm. And, yeah, it, yeah. it really can. It's like someone says, don't you know the uh, Apostles' Creed? I, it, it looks like you're reading it. I said, yes, I am reading yeah. it because up here, I know I'm going to forget something, and you all will know when I make it mistake, yeah. right? I so can't hide it by saying... It's plastered on the, the pulpit <laughs> and, and the, the lectern. All the, all the, it's our cheat sheet, so... Uh, Anyway, we're glad that you're joining us, and what we're doing is last week we began a four-part sermon series on John 3.16. Uh, many of you are reading with us a devotional piece that John wrote, and the idea is to break down the verse uh, in, in small bite-sized pieces in hopes that we could get everything out of the text, whether if we're looking at it in four phrases or two, two larger phrases. Uh, but the idea is we want to read together, study together, uh, and that sort of moves us and guides us. And so each week, we're looking at a different part of John 3.16. Last week, for God so loved the world. This week, that He gave His only Son. And then at the end of the week, you and I obviously share our thoughts. This is not as scripted as, as what you might think. This John and I meet throughout the week, and we take our own study and our own times of, of either ponderings and, and contemplations, and then we sort of kind of go back and forth. And so you get some of this as, as if we were going through our small group together. And last week, many of you were here, or you've maybe read the passage that uh, was the week's assignment, and you know that we start with, for God so loved the world, and, and it's a risky, radical, even offensive love by God. And God is the prime mover meaning that God is not, I think you like to use the word coerced, I like to use the word manipulated, that God loves because God chooses, God desires to love, and out of that love, He is willing even to uh, take on, invite, and even absorb the pain or anxiety that can exist in a relationship. When we choose to love, and God is the example of this, when we choose to love, we invite anxiety into our relationship. We, we invite the risk of things could go wrong. And that's what happened in our text that we used last week, the second half of Luke 15, the prodigal son, where we see this, this, uh, this parent, this father that loves, he invites the risk. It's very radical in how he loves. And, and, and yet, 
something happens. The younger son leaves. The older son has already left. And there's levels of restoration. And when the younger son comes home, it's full restoration between both the, the son and, and the father. We know that from the symbols of, of sandals, robe, ring. But it's not just on an individual level. It's communal because there's what? There's a party. And the party invites the entire community to participate in that level of love that's all dictated and driven by, by the parent, by the father. And, and you said something that was interesting to, to me this week that you know, God loves this way not just for the two in the parable, but he loves this way for the world. And, and so he, that he, he, he chose to demonstrate that love, but how? Well, he, he chose to demonstrate that by giving his son. So that's where we get... Um, the second part of John 3.16. And, and really, you, you could look at John 3.16 as two sections, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And, and the two sections right there is the incomprehensible, in unconditional, uh, you, un, you cannot understand this type of love. And that is the love that, that becomes the, the catalyst for him to give. And, and this, is, this is really important because you, you figure if God just loved the world and did not put that into action, we would have um, something so shallow. It, it would be like God coming down through Jesus and Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives and he is shouting at the top of his voice, I love you. <clears throat> and then he goes back up to heaven. Good job there, by the way. Well, you like yeah, that? I did. I was yeah. impressed. But, but, but do, you, do you see that? Look, the first couple years of my, five years of my marriage, 32 years of been married, I did, I wish I would have learned this quicker, you know, that just saying I love you, Lisa, is not quite everything that it plays out to be. And then I tried to change it. It says, when she would question, I would say, well, I love you and I mean it, right? No. I had to learn, we all have to learn this reciprocating love, this reciprocating love through demonstration. Right. And, and, um, and, and you know, to hear that God did not send his son just to, to, uh, to proclaim a love, that he loves us, or even just to go through a McDonald's drive through in first century A.D. on his Cadillac chariot and, and, and give the person in the drive through a track. It, it's one thing to share the love, and, there, and there's, there's totally appropriate ways to do that. But the real way that the love is known is when it's demonstrated. Right. Well, you, you said something this week. What is it? Uh, love not known. Yeah. Or, love good? not shown yeah. is love that is not known. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I didn't come up with it. Okay. Well, I was trying to give you some credit. So, uh, you, you know... Uh, Anyway, I thought it was great, so I've actually wrote it down and put it. It's one of those sticky notes in in my office. But you, you, but you, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Do you want me to sign it for you after the yeah, service? Exactly right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, but, but you think about all the other ways that God could have been motivated, and I think right. the, this this idea ties very closely to where we are. Of God could have been motivated to give such an immeasurable, significant, valuable gift of His Son. All the, all the ways that he could have been motivated to do that, to, to, um, to, uh, rest, um, to get our attention, to you know, um, get us to do something for him, um, or, or even the different things that God could have given instead of his son. I mean, we would have imagined that the father at the prodigal son of the prodigal son, when he came back, we would have been okay with him saying, yeah, I'm going to accept you back, but just let me tell you all the ways you ticked me off. Let, sure. let me just put you in your place. Like it's and transaction. Yeah, this yeah. transaction. Let me. I got to get this off. My, but but us coming back to God, it's it's this, it's this, uh, um, this. We we don't understand the motivation behind it to be something so beautiful centered around His nature mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to do with me. And you mentioned this week about, and I like this image too. This arc of Scripture. Yeah. So, I mean, I know we have sort of danced around with Luke chapter 15 and the prodigal son, but, you know, just in our time of talking back and forth, you know, we were just sort of popcorn in all these different scriptures. And, and the arc or the, the meta narrative of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is this love of God that's demonstrated. Absolutely. And I know one of your favorite passages 
uh, is Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were yet still helpless, or in some cases still sinners, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person perhaps someone might possibly dare to die. But then verse 8, which I know that you love, but, but God demonstrated yeah. his own love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah, the beautiful of that nature is, is the very first two words is but God. Right. The but God. This is something, this, this is like the, the, um, the crack of the sky that opens up the, from the clouds and opens up the sunshine when you realize that this is a but God moment. That's not a but John moment or a but St. Paul moment. This is something that God... Yeah, God is the prime mover. Prime mover. God, yeah. and, then, and then in Luke 19, I mean, you know, Luke loves to draw upon this seeking and saving. And I want you to speak a little bit about the verbs. You know, Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Yeah, this, and, and they're very transitive verbs. Um, you ever play hide and seek? Hide and seek. Um, really... Uh, um, the success of the game is to make sure each party does what they're told to do. Someone has to hide and someone has to seek. What if you hide and nobody seeks? <laughs> That's what my family used to do with me. Okay, we're going to play. Yeah. You go hide. <laughs> Three days. Five, le- five hours later, I'm right? Yeah. Really good. John, you're but the best. Just imagine, <laughs> just imagine if Jesus came just to seek out the lost and say, you're lost. You're lost, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost. She's got a purpose. Yeah. To I, save. So it's not yeah, just, so yeah. it's not just the seeking, it is the seeking and the saving. The seeking and the saving. Yeah. And that was in the parable of the Zacchaeus when the Pharisees are grumbling. Right. And he says, Listen, I didn't come. My whole to, purpose. Yes. Yeah. This this is who I am. I came to seek and to save the lost. So if we think about God's love and how radical and risky that it is, and then God again is the prime mover, loves out of his own nature, and, and he demonstrates that love, and, and the demonstration is for a purpose. And uh, so it's not just so that people see the love, but it's to see the depths and to allow that to move in their life. Which brings me to one of our favorite Old Testament uh, books is the book of Hosea. Yeah. And Hosea, you know, whether it's two historical persons or if we're looking at an Old Testament parable between uh, uh, Israel and God on one level, that's a separate conversation. But what I love about Hosea is you've got this one who, who knowing full well that the relationship is prob- might be broken, that covenant's going to be broken, and yet Hosea repeatedly, time after time, goes and to either purchase back or to win back for the purpose of a restoration of the covenant. And uh, so, I mean, when we, you and I were talking, it, it's easy to go from, you know, something academic where we just try to comprehend God's love, but to really allow it to, to have for that purpose to be effective in our own life, that, that God is willing to go to great lengths, even the giving of His Son, for, for our wholeness, and, for, and, and not just seeking, but seeking with a purpose so that our whole life could be different. I, I know last week we talked a little bit about the Ragamuffin Gospel, which is a book that both you, you and I, uh, we definitely like. And, and if we, he used the word grace, but it's the same concept of love. It says, love tells us that we are accepted just as we are. We not, may not be the kind of people that we want to be. We may be a long, long way from our goals. We may have more failures than achievements. We may not be wealthy or powerful or spiritual. We may not even be happy, but we are nonetheless accepted by God, held in His hands. And if we use language from today, we are nonetheless sought by God for that one purpose, transformation. It it is absolutely amazing. And in just a few moments, I know um, uh, Shane is going to read a passage from Isaiah. But you know, when we look at these two parts of this verse, that God loved the world, and because of that love, it predicated into action a gift of insurmountable um, worth, that we can't, it's incomprehensible, that we can't understand it. It is easy for us to stand on this side of that and say, God, how wonderful you are, and how wonderful that gift is, and rightly so. I mean, we should be doing that. But I don't think that is entirely the entire picture God wants us to get. 
I think there's something else God wants us to realize. Not necessarily His love for us, and that love being demonstrated through the gift of His Son. I think there's something else. And if I could say it like this, it would be this way. What He wants you to get out of this is what we all need to get out of it when we look at the cross. There are two things that we must come to grips with when we look at the cross. The first is, when I look at the cross, I have to admit that there is something so significantly wrong with me. So wrong that it required the death of Jesus to fix it. I don't care where we are on that model, if we believe in Christ or or God and His love here, but... Whether we believe it or not, the idea is, if it is true, then there is something wrong with me, with you, with you, with all of us, that it required God's Son to be given. How insignificant we would have looked into the idea if God just gave us happiness, or God just gave us wealth, or health, but because He gave something of his, Himself, We've got to come to grips. The second is this. When you look at the cross, you cannot miss the message that there is something so profound about me. And that is, that is the thing that we often miss. I think it's right that God is the object of our praise, our worship, for His love and His gift. But I also think that we should not miss our sacred worth, that he did this for us, for you, for the person you work with, play ball with, for our leaders, for those running for office, that God did this for us. We we, we should be able to lean into, at least put our ear towards the idea that we have significant worth. So if you think along that lame, same thread, the Isaiah 53 passage, and so you can see both the need of um, our need for that level of love and then at the same time the level of worth because of that love, what God wants to do. Isaiah 53, 3 through 7, some of you are familiar with this passage. It reads this way, and it's talking about Jesus. He was despised and rejected by humanity, a man of suffering, uh, familiar with pain like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was cruised, crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him. That's, I love that passage there. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us turned to our own way, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. So it's not just the love. It's a love that is shown for us to experience. And eventually it could lead to our wholeness because we need it. And thanks be to God that he does it this way. One of the things that we often need or uh, an experience in, in order to sort of comprehend this level of love, and you have it in communion. In communion, you hold two symbols, bread, juice, or bread in a cup, and they, they stand for this level of love that God demonstrated for you and for me for our wholeness. In holding both of those, we see the level of God willing to seek and to save that which was lost for our benefit and for his glory. At this time, I want to invite you, if you would, take your hymn books and turn with me to uh, page 12 as we prepare our hearts to receive this level of love. Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. So therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. 
We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And hear the good news. Christ died for you while you were yet a sinner. That is proof of God's love toward you. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory Amen. to God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join there in ending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward at this time. Uh, they'll prepare our altar. Um, in a few moments, they'll cue your roll, I mean your pew. If you'll exit out of the pew uh, closest to the windows and come down, you can either stand or kneel at the altar. Both of those are appropriate. You'll be given a piece of bread and then also a cup. Go ahead and uh, eat the bread and partake of the cup, and you can dispose of the cup uh, at the altar. You'll see places for those. Uh, and then uh, there'll be a dismissal prayer, and we'll all go back, or you'll go back to your seat in the spirit of prayer uh, and reflection while others are serving. If you'd like to leave any types of gifts of benevolence, uh, those urns are set up. They'll, they'll, we, those gifts will be received and then used in our community. It is with a grateful heart that we receive this gift, this demonstrated love for us. May your name be glorified forever. Amen.
Oh God, in these gifts we give thanks to hold this demonstrated love, the body and blood of Christ. May your name be glorified forever. Amen. God, it is in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we receive these gifts and pray for your name to be glorified forever. Amen. God, we are humbled by this gift, and may your name be glorified in our lives and in our witness. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. God, for this gift of love, we give thanks and ask that your name be glorified in us. And we pray in your name. Amen.
Oh God, for this grace and love that you give to us through your Son, may your name be glorified forever. Amen. God, for this and so much more, we give thanks. We're humbled by your love. May you be glorified forever. Amen. What wondrous love is this, one willing to give his life for another. For this we give thanks to God. Amen. receive this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
to the one who came to seek and to save the lost. Oh God, we are eternally grateful. May your name be glorified forever. Amen. God, we receive this gift with a grateful and humble heart, and we pray that your name be glorified forever. Amen. I want to invite you, if you would, please stand with me and turn to hymn number 622. There is a fountain filled with blood. We're going to stand and sing the first and the fifth only. First and fifth. I invite you to receive this choral benediction.